It is impossible to produce superior performance unless you do something different from the majority. In the book, Richer, Wiser, Happier, author William Green opens up the chapter on Sir John Templeton with this insightful quote. Now, this is pretty much all we need to know about Sir John Templeton's investment philosophy. And it echoes a lot of what we may recognize with investors such as Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. If you want to remain an average investor, then you should do what every other investor is doing. The only way to outperform the markets is to do something differently. Sir John Templeton was born in 1912 in a rural town in Tennessee, and his story is the epitome of a rags to riches story. He started with basically nothing, and at the time of his death in 2008, he was a billionaire. Over his 38 year investing career, he racked up an astounding 14.5% return. That means that $100,000 invested at inception would now be worth $17 million. In this outstanding book, William Green profiles some of the most successful investors of all time. And I might say that Sir John Templeton appears to be one of the most, if not the most eccentric of them all. For instance, in his 50s, he renounced his US citizenship and up and moved to the Bahamas. And in his later years, Templeton focused a lot on philanthropic efforts. Templeton was famously a spiritual man. And in fact, he donated millions of dollars to figure out whether or not there was a scientific way to prove if prayers worked or not. But perhaps one of the most eccentric things that Templeton did was where he actually cut his teeth in the markets. At first glance, it appears that Templeton started his investing career at possibly the worst time in history. America was still reeling and dealing with the after effects of the Great Depression. And on top of that, in 1939, all hell broke loose when Germany invaded Poland in 1939, effectively beginning what we would know as World War II. Of course, it's a reasonable reaction to break into a mad panic at the news of a potentially large-scale war breaking out. But did Templeton join in on the hysteria? Well, no, actually. He reasoned that, well, his job is to find the companies that are selling for less than they're worth, which is the old mantra that we know as value investing. And then he asked, if there's potential for a large-scale war, what companies will prosper the most? Green quoted Templeton as saying that perhaps 90% of American businesses would actually do better in the case of a war. Now imagine yourself sitting in anybody's shoes considering the possibility that the entire world was potentially going to collapse due to this ongoing war. Well, it may seem like Templeton has ice in his veins due to his ability to think so analytically and rationally about investing at a time like this. He identified 104 companies that were hit really hard by the depression and their shares were trading for less than $1 per share. And he basically put $100 into each of these companies thinking if some of these go down, it's not that big of a loss, but a lot of these will have potential for huge upside in the case that they actually do recover due to all of the wartime growth. And you might be asking, how did that strategy play out? Well, it's probably, considering that he's been covered in this book, it went according to his plan. Out of the 104 companies that he purchased, 100 of them he made a profit on. And he made about five times his investment on this contrarian bet. And I'm saying this again because I want to reinforce it for myself, as well as any of you out there, that it's so important to understand his willpower of steel in this situation. He had the discipline to sit through an entire world war sitting on these trash companies that everybody thought that was they were going to just disappear. And he, he had his own mind made up. He had the conviction to sit on his own bets and see it through. Of course, it paid off for him in the end. And well, the rest is history. If you want to learn more about Templeton's early career and his biography, please check out this book and especially focus on chapter two. So what can we take away from this story in particular? Well, Templeton is famous for coining the phrase, the point of maximum pessimism. So we see the masses basically in, enraptured in panic and fear due to both a depression and a war. And yet Templeton found that this was indeed the perfect time for him to begin investing. He saw an opportunity that frankly, most of the world didn't see at all and he pounced when it was most important. This goes back to the title of the chapter, The Willingness to Be Lonely. This general frame of mind is one of the most important mental models for investing, period. Not only are you physically lonely most of the time when you're investing, considering 
Most of investing is just reading and thinking about the past, present, and future of businesses and the world around you. Imagine Warren Buffett, for instance, sitting in his office in Omaha with the blinds drawn closed, just reading his newspapers and his annual reports. In investing, there's not a lot of physical movement or excitement, and Monish Pabrai always equates investing to watching paint dry. So if you're super interested by watching paint dry, then you're gonna love investing. But more important than the physical implications of this loneliness are the emotional and mental implications. Investing is a lonely road mentally. We started off this video with the quote about the only way to outperform the market is to act differently than the rest of the market. And the only way to consistently act differently than the market is to have a conviction and mental willpower that your ideas are actually right. Templeton, Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger are all independent thinkers. And it's great to be an independent thinker, but you also have to have the conviction to back up that thinking. So if you believe that you are correct about something and you see the future playing out in a way that's different than the general consensus, there's a big opportunity to make a lot of money, as we have saw with Templeton's investments during World War II. At the end of the day, Templeton needed to think differently than other investors in order to make excellent returns. We might go as far to say that John Templeton and Warren Buffett don't have the tribal gene. And by that, I mean they don't have the willingness to fit into a tribe like most of humanity does. Included in this group might be other successful investors, artists or entrepreneurs or musicians, people who really don't give a damn what everybody else is thinking. And I'm sure as you can imagine, as an investor, that trait is invaluable. Templeton was willing to walk his own path and it obviously led to outstanding financial results for him throughout his life. So according to John Templeton, what does it take to be a non-tribal investor? Green lays out six guiding principles to help us along our way. The first rule is to beware of emotion. I'm sure that anybody who's participated in investing for any period of time understands that managing your emotions is a lot harder than actually deciding which business to invest in. Now this could take the shape for anything from managing your emotions when there's general market euphoria, such as we see with the rise with Bitcoin, GameStop, and Tesla, or when there's great pessimism, as John Templeton experienced in the troughs of the Great Depression. We can get sidetracked very easily trying to get rich quickly, and that's a great way for us to lose a lot of money. And in my opinion, the best way to combat this is to understand the business that you're investing in really well. For me, part of the help of having an investing YouTube channel is to make sure that I really do understand the core principles of the thesis for the companies that I'm investing in. The second rule Templeton says is an even bigger issue than emotion. He says that we need to beware of our own ignorance. Now, Lee Lu harps on this very frequently. He always says that one of the most important parts of investing is being intellectually honest with yourself. This applies to the companies that we own in our portfolio, to the books and the media that we consume, to impact our knowledge diet. One of Templeton's most important ideas for this rule is to remember that there are two sides to every argument. Charlie Munger always talks about the fact that he doesn't think he has the right to speak on a subject unless he can state the opposing side better than somebody else actually on the opposing side. So we can think that we need to understand not only the bull case, but the bear case extremely well in order to probably feel comfortable with the investment that we're going to make. So keep in mind the two different sides to each investment. Templeton's third rule is to diversify broadly. I 100% agree with Templeton's idea of diversifying broadly. If you're the type of investor who doesn't care about valuing or analyzing businesses, you just want a safe place to put your money. And the best way to do that, as Warren Buffett always says, is probably an S&P 500 index fund or a mutual fund of some kind. However, I don't believe that diversifying is the best way to maximize your returns. So for me, I don't diversify. I run a concentrated portfolio. You can probably check this video out over here if you wanna learn more about that. The fourth rule is that investing requires patience. This could probably have been roped into that first rule about managing your emotions because being patient is basically all emotion. Templeton waited a half a decade or more for his investment in these World War II bets to pan out properly. It's easy to look back in hindsight and realize that of course, that was a no-brainer. Great, great job, Templeton. But I'm sure each year, as each year passed, he was probably a little bit worried that perhaps his big investment play wasn't going to work out after all. I'll say that the intrinsic value for a company rarely fluctuates as much as the stock prices for companies. So 
in order to capture the full value of a company, it might be best just to think that I want to buy businesses that I'm never going to sell. That seems to be the approach that Monish Pabrai is now taking, where he wants to buy a company that is hopefully going to be a 100 bagger. And of course, to capture all of those multiples, you're probably going to need to hold it for a long time. So you better make sure that it's a damn good business. So yeah, managing your emotion and managing your patience go hand in hand with both understanding the business that you're investing in and having high conviction in that bet along with being able to ride out even painful years where it might not look like your thesis is going to play out. Fifth is more of a practical tip that I have actually used in the past, which is to look at companies in the past five years that have performed the worst and think about those as potential candidates for investment. So one of the techniques that I've used in the past is to actually go to the 52 week low section in the Wall Street Journal and look at those companies really hard. In order for this to work, you need to determine whether the company or sector is facing short-term head headwinds that could possibly be reversed, or if it's a company in a secular downtrend, such as newspapers have been since the dawn of the internet. There was a great Asian financial crisis in 1997, and the Korean stock market took a nosedive. And during that time, Templeton decided that the South Korean stock exchange was the cheapest stock exchange in the world based on future corporate earnings. So the PE of the South Korean stock market dropped from about 20 to 10 in six months. In less than two years, his $10 million investment rose 266%. So sometimes opportunities that look like we're at the point of ultimate maximum pessimism are actually great investment opportunities. And Templeton seemed to be the master of those. And Templeton's final rule is to not chase fads. And I could sum this section up in one word, Dogecoin. Basically, don't invest in bullshit. Green chronicles how Templeton in the late 1990s during the internet stock bubble actually shorted 84 of what he considered to be the most overvalued internet stocks at the time. And as you probably guessed, this investment paid off huge. He made over $90 million in just a few short months after the dot-com bubble crashed. So as a keen student of human behavior, Templeton understood and identified an opportunity to make money when things were just too euphoric. And again, this goes back to being non-tribal. I mean, he's betting against a time where there was basically a mania, where you could make money putting anything, throwing darts at a dartboard of any stock that you chose. And Templeton, again, went against the grain and still ended up making a ton of money. Few investors represent the idea of a non-tribal investor quite like Sir John Templeton. If you enjoyed this video, you may enjoy my video over here where I talk about Lee Lu's recent fireside chat. I love this book, Richer, Wiser, Happier, so much. It's one of the best investing books I've read in a long time. I'm planning on doing a video covering each, if not all, individual chapters because I think each chapter has so much to offer us as investors and just students of life. Let me know in the comments below if you enjoyed this talk about Sir John Templeton and if there's anything else that you've learned about Templeton that I missed. Please like the video and subscribe to the channel if you want to stay up to date for the videos that I'll be putting out about the book Richer, Wiser, Happier. Anyway, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for sticking to the end of the video and I will see you next time.